So thanks very much for giving me this meeting. Um, I was asked to give an introduction to uh, the Mia Model program in the general setting, the classical setting, uh, because Callum and I will be talking about Mia Model program for foliations. And so I guess for many, uh, this is just classic background and feel free to skip it. I'm just going to say what are the main tools and the main ingredients of the minimum model. I'm just going to talk about the main tools of the minimum model program. Okay, so let me give a very vague idea. The very vague idea is to how start the classification of projective varieties. So we work over the complex numbers. And um, for us, X will be most likely a projective variety uh, over X, over C, of dimension N. So we want to somehow classify these varieties from a variation point of view, and the minimum model program provides the first step in this direction. So again, very, very vaguely, the idea is that we want to decompose after taking some kind of transformation, which we'll see later, um, X into three blocks, into three, which are called usual building blocks, which are funnels, or varieties where the canonical um, divisor is anti-ample, in other words, minus k x ample, Kabi-Aus, for which k x is trivial, or at least numerically trivial, and the opposite of being final canonically polarized, which of course means that KX example. So the idea is that after some variation transformation, any projective variety can be somehow uh, built by this object, this one of these three objects, I mean, family of these three objects. So let's see, let's start by looking at the classic example, which is the case of uh, uh, surfaces. In dimension one, of course, we can immediately use this classification by uh, the classic results by, I mean, the classic um, uniformization theorem, which is uh, due to remind others. So let me start from the case of surfaces. So in dimension two. So in other words, yeah, I'm assuming that X is a smooth surface. Okay, so in this case, what we know is that we, I mean, we have a very good idea on where we want to stop in the minimum of the program. What does it mean? It means that let's assume that there exists a curve E, which is rational. In other words, but rational to P1 inside X, such that the self intersection is minus one. Then by Casanova theorem, we know that there is a rational transformation, in other words, a blowdown of uh, which contracts X to a point. In other words, there exists a proper morphism from X to Y, which is Barasha. So Barasha means it's an isomorphism or on an open set, um, on a non trivial open set of X, such that the exceptional locus of Y is exactly equal to E. So now the idea is we can do this, I mean, we can replace, it's also smooth, I should say, why it's also smooth for I surface. play this game as many times as we want. Every time we do this game, the second Betty number decreases by one. And so at some point we need to stop. So we can assume that after finitely many steps, there are no more um, such a curves. In this case, we have, I mean, once we arrive to this picture, we have two different possibilities. Either Kx is an F, which means that it's somehow in the middle within uh, the Calabria case and the canonical polarized case, which means again, which that Kx times C is no negative for any curve C in X. And in this case, X is called mirror model. I will see why this is a nice representative of the class of the rational class of X. Or the second possibility is that uh, there exists uh, a from X to something smaller dimension for which the fiber is final. So more in explicit terms, either X is Barashan, sorry, X is P2, or 
there exists a morphism eta from X to C, where C is a leaf. The general fiber is P1. Okay, so the idea of the minimum of the program is that we want to read this picture in a higher dimension, where things get, of course, more complicated from a few different points of view. The main reason is because blow down not the only admissible operation in order to get something interesting out of this. So, and this is again the beginning of a, a Morris program or Mia Morris program. So, we are working now in dimension um, uh, three or higher. So, let's suppose we're going to change this picture very soon, but let's suppose that X is again a smooth projective variety. Then this, this program is really an algorithm. In other words, it gives us a way to proceed in order to find a good representative to decompose our variety in the way we want it. So we consider again a few. So first, let's assume that Kx is not F. Then in this case, we're happy. So we stop here. It's really like an algorithm where we arrive to the point where we are happy. And again, here in this case, X is called a mirror model. And why, I already mentioned before, but why, why is this important? I mean, why is this nice? Well, the idea is that at least conjecturally, and this is true in dimension less or equal than um, three. At least conjecturally, there exists a morphism from X to some variety Z such that, um, sorry, should I say, um, well, there exists a positive integer m and an ample divisor on z, such that k, uh, m k x is the pullback of h. So why is this important? I mean, this is called abundance conjecture. Why is this important? Well, the reason is because the general fiber of this morphism we have the property that have a canonical device, which is trivial. So it turns out it gives us the Calabi-Yau looking for one of the blocks that compose the variety X. Okay, so I will continue. I mean, for us, this is a target. So I will continue, of course, um, this is the easiest case, namely when KX is an F. We already arrived to the point where um, we, uh, we can conclude. So now the question is, what if KX is not an F? And here, of course, the picture more, it's more, uh, it's richer. Then, of course, in this case, there exists a curve by definition on which the X is negative. Okay, so what happened to this curve? Well, the idea is that in few different steps, we'll see that we want to get rid of this curve in a similar way as what we did for surfaces. In the case of surfaces, we had a minus one curve and somehow we contracted to a point. Here, the situation is more difficult, but uh, let's see the steps which we are gonna work with. First of all, um, the main um, ingredient is Morris bend and break. We say that we can pretend the C is a rational curve. What does it mean? It means that um, for any point X and C, I'm assuming that uh, uh, the variety X is smooth for now. So uh, I'm hiding few technical details, but uh, for X smooth, what I'm, trying, what I'm writing now should be correct. So for any X and C, there exists the curve Psi, which is rational, which of course is contained in X, and which, is, which has the property that um, it's also negative with respect of C, of uh, KX that kx times c is negative. So let's draw a picture. Let's suppose that this is our curve c. So what we're saying is that for any point, we can find a curve which is rational, but rational to be one, with the same property that c has, namely that is negative with respect to the canonical divisor. Now it's very possible that c is equal to c. And so in this case, uh, what implies is that the c is rational from the beginning. Okay, now that we know that it's rational, 
somehow, I mean, we can assume that it's rational. What is the next step? The next step is to study the corner curves and find among the rational one, one which is more unique than the other, what is called an extreme array. So let me, uh, I will talk a little bit about what is called the cone theorem. We're going to see this, I guess, Carlo might be talking about this today. Um, um, which gives an idea of what to do in order to get rid of this curve. So, first of all, a little bit of notation. Let's suppose that, sorry, my handwriting is very bad. So, let's suppose that N1 of X is the, um, denotes the vector space over the ram, uh, Russia of the, of the real numbers. Generated by all the curves of X up to up to numerical equivalence. What does it mean up to numerical equivalence? It means that C1 is numerical equivalent to C1. If for any device would be, the product uh, with these curves coincides. Okay, so the reason why we work with this space is because after taking this uh, equivalence, it's a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, inside this space, we denote the cone of effective cycles. What is this? This is the set of the sums of all the classes where CI defines a proper curve, I mean, an integral curve. Okay, and this is, of course, a subset of N1X, which is convex. And actually, it's more than convex, it's a cone. Uh, namely, um, well, I mean, for any, for any element here, we can multiply by any positive constant, and there will be still an element here. So, the idea is that the way we draw this in order to visualize is that, so let's suppose that we are on N1x, we draw a section of this cone. So, something looks like this. So, this is cone here, which a priori might be or might not be closed. Okay, and uh, inside this cone, so again, we should imagine this as this is the two dimensional picture, which is given by a three dimensional vector space by considering the cone over this uh, um, shape. So over this set, we can distinguish two sides given by the canonical divisor. So the line Kx, or actually I should be more precise, Kx is equal to zero, represents all the elements inside this vector space and one of x on which k is zero. So, in other words, any here uh, c is such that kx times c is equal to zero. And then, of course, there is the positive part and the negative part. We can always do that, no matter how high the dimension of this vector space is. Now, what the cone theorem says is that on one side of the picture, namely the one above, I mean, the Kx positive part of the picture, we don't know much. But on the other side, we know quite a lot. We know, first of all, that it's closed, and also it's spanned by rational curves. So more precisely, the theorem says that, supposing this form is due to Mori, although there are many different versions, but in the, the very first theorem, it's, uh, on a projective variety which is smooth, is due to, uh, to Mori. So the theorem, roughly speaking, says that there are rational curves C1, C2, and so on. So country bending rational curves, such that the closure of an X, uh, of an EX, the closure of the effective corners curves, it's decomposable in two parts. The parts for which we don't know anything about, which I would denote by this symbol here. So it's this part here, basically. So it's, I use the symbol nx, px greater than zero. And we take the closure because again, we don't know whether it's closed or not. And then we need to sum all the rays, which are all the linear combination of all the rays, which are given by these curves here. Okay, so. On this side of the picture, maybe I should draw another uh, more precise picture at this point. 
on somehow uh, here we don't know anything uh, but here we know quite a bit oops so here we know nothing but here we know that it almost looks like a point. Actually, I could be much more precise. But um, namely, outside this hyperplane, Px equal to zero, um, it's really like a point. So it's generated by finitely many of these rays. So this is C1, C2, and C2. Okay, why is this useful? Because as I said a few minutes ago, we want to make sure that we contract uh, the suitable rays. So these rays are exactly the candidate. These are called extrema rays. And they're exactly the candidates for what to replace the minus one curves in um, dimension two in the case of surfaces. Okay, so once we have a, this theorem, it's quite an easy exercise to show that. Uh, so, how shall I say it? The corollary. There exists an ample device of A, or maybe I should be more precise, ample Q device, which means that some multiple of A, it's an integral uh, Cartier device, so, which is ample, such that, okay, maybe a picture will help. So the idea is that Kx, will, Kx plus A will define a supporting upper plane here. So this would be Kx plus a equal to zero, exactly in the same way that this line here represents Kx equal to zero. So, more specifically, I will write that Kx plus a times any curve is greater than equal to zero for any c inside, sorry, for any c inside the closure, the closure of the cone. But not only that, so this will imply that this green line is below the cone, right? But uh, we can be more precise. We can also say that it touches at exactly one point. So, and equality holds if and only if, sorry, maybe I should have say uh, fix C equal to CI for some CI. So we can do this game for NX to array. So let me choose one for all. So um, the equality holds if and only if C is inside uh, sorry, um, sorry, I need a mess. So this uh, fix C bar equal to CI. And um, the quality holds if and only if C belongs to the ray generated by C. Okay, so in other words, on every curve inside this cone, it's positive, except for the point where uh, the green line touched the cone, which is represented by in this picture C1. Okay, why is this corollary useful? Why do we need this? Well, we will see also in the case of foliation that one of the tools, although the order in the case of foliation will be slightly different, um, it's the base point free theorem. So I should give a name to this theorem. The way I state it uh, I, um, is due to Kavamata but he has strong contribution by Shukurov. I'm not going to explicitly say who did what, but um, for sure uh, they both play a big role in this theorem. Okay, so under this, with the setup as above, we have that Kx plus A semi-ample. I will explain what it means. Although it's very similar to what we say in case of the abundance conjecture. So what does it mean? It means that like in the case of the abundance conjecture, there exists a morphism psi from X to Z, such that M times Kx plus A is the pullback of some ample divisor H, where M is a positive integer and H it's an ample device on that. Okay, why is this useful? The idea is that we should think of this to be exactly the same morphism that was obtained by contracting the minus one curve. The idea is that this is going to contract something. So more precisely, so in particular, this follows immediately from what is written in the theorem. 
the curve C, a curve C maps to a point, if and only if C belongs to the array defined by C bar. So in other words, we could have that, let me go back to the picture, this ray here, the one given by, the one that I denote by C1 in this picture, is composed by many curves, right? Because we're taking some equivalence. But nevertheless, our morphism psi contracts exactly all those curves which are contained in that ray. Okay, so now we can proceed very similarly, or at least in a similar fashion as in the case of surfaces. But we have to distinguish some cases. So the first case, is the case on which, so rem remember, let's remember, we have a morphism, in order to fix the notation, we have a morphism from X to Z. So the first case is that the dimension Z is strictly less the dimension of X. So what does it mean? It means that the curve C on we, which are equivalent to some multiple of C bar, span the whole variety X. They cover the whole variety X. They, for every point of X, we can find a curve which is equivalent to a multiple of C bar. So in this case, Psi is called modifiable space. So what is the property of this modifiable space? At the beginning, we saw that one of the output of the model program for surfaces is the case where we map to something which is either a point or a curve, but the fiber is final. And here would be exactly the same. The general fiber of Psi it's a final variety. Again, I'm not very careful about singularities because I'm assuming here that X is smooth which is kind of a cheat, but um, uh, we'll see in a few minutes why. But um, nevertheless, the, the result is true in general. I mean, if you allow some similarities, what I'm saying uh, is true in general. Okay, what is the second case? The second case is that we assume the dimension of Z is equal to the dimension of X. And since I'm assuming that the fibers are connected, it's a fabrication, um, which we can always do by, stand, by taking the stand factorization. Um, this is exactly the same as saying that psi is rational. But it turns out that um, we, even in this case, we need to distinguish two subcases. So I'm going to assume um, case A and case B. So, so case A. In case in within the second case, we can assume case, case A in the case B. So by case A, I mean that the, lo the locus which is contracted, in other words, the exceptional locus of Psi. Remember, Psi maybe uh, is the one with the, Psi is the morphism in the green box from X to Z. So if Psi is but rational, exceptional locus of Psi is coincide with the locus where Psi is not an assembly morphism. So in the case A, this is a divisor. It's an upper surface. Okay, so recall that one way to see it is that exceptional locus of psi is the union of all the curves C, which are contained in that some ray uh, defined by uh, C bar. Okay, so maybe it's worth to draw a picture. So let's, oops, let's suppose that um, we have, this is our variety X. So it's nothing to do with the corner we were drawing before. And the exceptional locus, it's a surface. I mean, if X is a threefold, we assume that the exceptional locus is a surface. So I should write it, this is the exceptional locus. So what does it mean? It means that the morphism psi maps this red locus either in a curve or in a point. So let's take the case of a curve. But for sure it will contract it to something of lower dimension. I mean, uh, it will not be a surface anymore inside that. Okay, so what happens in this case? Well, in this case it happens that Z is um, not smooth in general. I mean, it could be that it's not a simple blow up, like in the case of, sur of surfaces. 
that might have some similarities. And that's why I was saying that we are cheating by assuming that X is, is moon. But not, nevertheless, the singularities that appear by doing this kind of operation are very much under control. They're called um, terminal singularities. So if you want, it's almost the definition of terminal singularities. Any singularities that come out from an MMP, so a step like the one we just did, it's called terminal singularity, uh, but mild. And uh, which are called terminal singularity. You will see this word or similar word very often. So in particular, we can still talk about canonical divisors. Uh, we can talk about um, intersection of the canonical divisor with any curve and so on, because the canonical divisor of Z is uh, Q Cartier. Multiple of uh, uh, the canonical divisor of Z is Cartier. So we can do intersection inside uh, Z. So in this case, the picture is very similar to the case of surface. Even if Z is not smooth, we can still replace, so in this case, we replace X by Z. We call it X just for convenience. And um, we start all over again. What does it mean? It means that um, if we get ZF, then we're done. Or if not, there is a curve on which it's negative, and we play exactly the same game as before. And notice that every time we do this game, the second betting number decreases by one. So this game cannot appear infinitely many times, starting from any variety X. It, this step can only be repeated finitely many times. And we even have a very good control, which is given by the topology of X. So in other words, the second betting number of X, or how many times this step could appear. So in this case, everything is very easy. It's very, very similar to the case of surfaces. Okay, but we didn't consider all the cases, right? We considered the second case where it's a branch morphism, but assuming that the exceptional locus of psi is a divisor. Now there is a third case to consider, which is still assuming that psi is a branch morphism, but in this case, ex the exceptional locus is not a divisor has got a mention greater than or equal than two. So let me draw a picture, which is very similar to what we had before. We have our variety X, and in this case, if you know, the only thing that can happen is that uh, the exceptional locus is a curve, because it must contain the curve C bar. And again, since this is a branch amorphous, the only thing that can happen is that this curve here is mapped to a point. So, of course, in higher dimension, the situation is slightly more difficult because, uh, uh, I mean, the exceptional locus could still be higher dimensional, and um, uh, the locus where it's mapped, it's gonna, it could be something of dimension, opposite dimension. But the picture is very, very similar to uh, the case of triplets. So, what do we do this time? It would be very tempting to say that we replace X by Z, we repeat the same game as before. The problem is that in this case, it's, very, it's easy, it's fairly easy to prove that Z is always very singular. I mean, whenever Z is obtained this way, so maybe I should say in this case. So what does it mean to be very singular? Well, for instance, actually, there is no nice canonical divisor. So there is no M for which, uh, there is no positive M such that M K Z is Cartier. So sorry, M because it's not Cartier for any M. Positive number. So we cannot do intersection here. We cannot replace X by Z because the main problem would be that uh, uh, we're not even, it would not even make sense to talk about being F or being negative with respect to a curve. Okay, so what do we do in this case? In this case, the picture is a little bit more complicated, and this is one of the main ideas of the new model program or uh, the program that was started by Mori. This is the main difference, I would say, between the classical new model program, which is due to Castanova School, to new uh, model program which came 60 years after, thanks to Mori and many others. So what do we do? Well, what is possible to prove, and we know that uh, this is true in any dimension for, by now, 
is that there is always something which is called a flip. So let me highlight this word. What is a flip? And we'll talk a lot about flips. So I'm going to give a, a precise definition of what flip is. It's a little bit technical, but the idea is very simple. We had our curve, um, which is drawn by this red curve in this picture. And we want to replace this curve by another curve, almost like saying with the opposite orientation. In other words, that uh, on X, this curve has negative intersection with respect to PX. On a new variety, which is the uh, output of the flip, will be um, uh, positive. So let me give a more precise definition. So a flip is really like a diagram. So in other words, we have the morphism X to Z. This is given by the base point free theorem, the theorem that we saw a few minutes ago. Okay, so the good thing, uh, the thing about the flip is that there exists another variety, which I'm gonna denote by X prime, which also maps to Z in such a way that Psi prime is also rational. And what else? Um, the exceptional locus of Psi prime also has the dimension that we're going to. Exactly like before. And uh, Psi of C prime maps to a point, if and only if, C prime is contained in the variety generated by some curve, which I'm going to denote by um, C bar plus, similar to C prime bar, similar to the case of X, for some curve C prime, such that, I'll, go, I'll draw a picture in one minute, hopefully it will be clear in one minute, but uh, such that Kx, time, Kx prime times C prime is positive, okay? So the, the induced map from uh, X to X prime, which of course exists because we are composing two barrage morphisms, Psi and Psi prime inverse. It's, it's what is called the flip. Okay, so it might be worth to see a picture before. So we had a variety X, which contracts to, um, which contracts a curve to a point. So maybe let me call C bar curve for simplicity. Okay, what is happening is that we created another variety, which also maps to uh, Z, and which also contracts a curve which I call C, C bar prime. Okay, so the idea is that this induced map the, the dash map will get rid of C bar and attach C bar prime. What is the advantage of doing this? There are two advantages. First of all, X prime is also, in other words, it has mild singularities, so we can really replace X by X prime. And what else do we know? Well, I mean, it looks like, I didn't pay attention, it looks like, uh, okay, we remove a curve and we add one curve. What's the point of doing this? Well, the big advantage is this, uh, is this fact that the sign is changing. So we replace a curve which has negative self-intersection, sorry, negative intersection with Kx by a curve which has positive intersection with uh, Kx. So we, in some way, we made the Kx, the canonical device, more positive than before, okay? So now, what do we do? Well, I guess it's clear. Since X prime is turned, so the similarities are not too bad. And since it's more positive, Kx prime is more positive than Kx, the idea is that we start all over. We start again, sorry. So in other words, we ask ourselves, is X prime minimum model? Is Kx prime nef? Um, if yes, then we're done. We found the mirror model. If not, we try to find another curve, which is rational. We contract it and we proceed this way. Now, there is a price to pay in this. Now, the question is, why does this stop? And actually, we don't know the answer to this question in general. What does it mean? It could mean that we produce an algorithm that never produces what we want. It could continue forever. 
So this is a very much open problem, um, which is called um, termination. So in dimension three, it's known to be okay, again by Risato Shukuru. So at least in dimension three, we know that we cannot have an infinite sequence of flips which terminate into what is a mini model or a modified space. Why? Because what Shogun proves is that there cannot be in any infinity many uh, sequence of flips, which um, implies immediately by what we did so far that uh, at some point, after repeating this game finitely many times, we obtain a manifold, which, um, a variety which is either minimal or it emits a modified space, namely a morphism to something of lower dimension for which the fiber is um, final. Now, as I said, in higher dimension, over the next few lectures, we'll only talk about in dimension three. So uh, in some sense, this is good enough. But uh, let me just mention, since we're here, um, that in dimension bigger than three, we have some partial results. Namely, in two cases, we know we don't know termination, but we know that there exists um, a special sequence of flips which terminates. So, what does it mean? It means that there could be infinitely many sequences, but one of them gives what we want, flips terminates. If one of the twelves. So the first case is what I will call A, which was mentioned in the previous talk, uh, X is unruled. Namely, X is covered by rational curve. So in this case, we know that there exists a sequence of flips and the disorder contraction, such that um, after finitely many steps, first of all, being unruled, it's a rational property. So if we start from something unruled, every step we have something unruled. And after finitely many steps, what we get is a morphable space. So in this case, we end with a, a morphable space. Again, this means uh, information for which the, fam the fiber is final. The reason why I mention all these results is because we're going to see something similar for the case of relations. And the second case, which for which we know the answer in full generality in any one is when X is a general type. This means that the X is big, which means that if we look at the section of all the powers of KX, this, I mean, the dimension gives goes like a polynomial which um, has degree equal to n. So where c is a positive number and n is the dimension of x. And again, this is a rational property. What does it mean? It means that if we start from something which is a general type and we apply the disorder control or a flip, we continue to have a variety which is a general type. So also in this case, we know that, uh, we don't know termination of flips, but we know that there exists a special sequence of flips which terminates. And so we end up with. Um, so here should have seen up. We end up with um, a mean model, namely a new variety uh, Y, which is uh, still general type. So in particular, the canonical device is too big, but now it's also an F. Okay, I think that I uh, ran out of time, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you.